much. Uh, many thanks, Ian. Uh, Scott, Andrew. Um, Cole, thanks for me. Um, so, firstly, thank you to the Monetary Standard for allowing me to participate in this debate. Um, my name's Scott Andrew. Um, this is not really about me, but I will just tell you I've lived in Palmerston my whole life, so I love the place. I'm a theatre director, but again, this is not about me. Um, my whole campaign, along with the other five candidates that are standing on this platform this year across the country, uh, um, is really about trying to broaden and shift the conversation at this table to something a bit more relevant when it comes to our future. So basically, given that we've now entered the sixth great extinction on Earth and that we are now at an epochal shift, which is an undeniable stage of human evolution, um, the Money Free Party proposes a transition to a new social model to actually solve the growing problems that we face. That, that we've endured on this red and red and blue seesaw of death for 80 years. So anyway, um, that is the policy. So I could talk at length about transition ideas about that, but that is the core policy. Now I know that that idea is very foreign to many people who have never thought about sort of that sort of broad idea, and I've had all this the whole campaign. Um, but what if any of this campaign's shown anything is that there are people out there that are desperate for this sort of conversation at this table from these people, right? So. The core point is, the core. I'll just make it really clear, without the removal of socio-economic inequality as linked to economic roots, there is a serious need for concern about what the future holds. Unannounced to most, there is a strong public health argument against the existence of economic stratification in class, and by extension this means that there is a strong public health argument against the mechanisms of our society that create, reward and reinforce this destructive imbalance, namely the imposed system of market economics. So I challenge the other candidates here today to actually step outside, please, the lip service, the usual lip service and rhetoric that is paid on the political stage to actually address some real issues outside of this board game that we are all forced to play. Thank you so much. Cool, thank you. Um, so creating employment um, kind of doesn't fit with where we need to head, so I know that's really weird for people to understand, but basically, um, if you haven't caught up yet, the labour for income system is not only becoming more and more inefficient, it simply isn't going to be able to keep everyone employed on the planet. And if, as long as we persist with this idea that we need to create jobs to keep the money circulating, unfortunately what it's just going to do is cumulatively destroy everything, predictably. Now we know this, and again, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be read around the bush about it, but basically what we need to do is actually start to move, start to reduce production. And this is the fatal flaw of what the other political parties are not talking about, is the only way that you guys can get out of the ecological crisis that we're facing is to reduce production. And the only way you can do that is to remove jobs that produce all this stuff that we don't really need in society because we've been conditioned that our wants are actually real. Um, we need 27 planets by 2050 to keep the current model going. Obviously that's not real, realistic. We need to stop assuming planets into existence. And I know that sounds weird, but that's what we're doing with this um, infinite growth model that we have. So um, well, I do have a policy to basically transition to that type of model, um, you know, basically to basically remove jobs, but that's not what the question was. So in answer to the question, I have no policy to create jobs because creating jobs um, just for the sake of creating jobs to keep monetary circulation going and maintain the production that it's at is only going to continue to destroy us as fast as possible. Thank you, Scott. And Scott. Thank you. So, yeah, sure. So, look, if, you, if the public is going to insist on pushing forward with the current social model that we have, then the discourse is only going to remain, as it has for about 80 years now, that this idea that we don't have enough of this fiction to solve these problems. And that's a false narrative. Just make it really clear. There are people out there that know this and want this discussed. So, basically, yes, short term, easily, we could throw some digits at it to fix it, right? And just, just actually just fix it. Or long term, if we're really serious about actually solving some of these problems, and all the problems are connected by the way when you take a systems view, then we need to broaden our view of possibility and actually look at the technological application we have to solve the problem in regards to the gorge. We have sophisticated manners of implementation now, technologically. I, I would say we're about 60 to 100 years behind in the application of our technology as a species because of this imposed system of so-called economics. So basically, if we actually broadened our view of possibility, we could solve the problem very quickly with not much human labour. I mean, we're 3D printing houses in a day for like $12,000 at the moment, even in this model, but we pretend that we can't solve these problems technologically because we don't have enough of the funding 
to you know pay for the intellectual property and all that. I understand that, but there are people out there that want this conversation desperately broadened, and these people are paid once they're elected to actually solve the problems, and that's what the Money Free Party proposes, to actually solve these problems once and for all. Thank you. Um, so yeah, obviously housing, a massive issue. Um, housing is a core human need. Unfortunately, and you know, again, unannounced to most, that this system has no criterion of need built into it, which is why we have the crisis we have everywhere, right across society. Right? And once you understand what the criterion of human need is, it's objective and it's universal and it's undeniable, and those who deny that it exists presuppose it, they assume it. A need is and only is that without which life capacity is always reduced. Everyone is entitled to a house or a shelter to live in, right? But, see, when I was born on this planet, everything had been sold off a long, long time ago. And this idea that we have to compete for an ever-dwindling amount of fiction um, is just absolutely insane that we're still imposing this onto our children as relevant. And again, there are people out there that want this conversation had at this level, so this is why it's happening. Um, and it's hilarious that it takes someone like me that has to do it. So basically, we currently have to play this board game, this property game, because that's all it is. It's just a game. Right? We can change the game anytime we like. We only have to make the collective decision. Right? Um, as far as policies to accelerate the transition to the new model, basically, which is emerging, it's coming whether we like it or not, whether we realise it or not. Um, you could, there's a lot of empty commercial buildings that could be outfit to housing instantly, quite quickly, very quickly. Um, again, technological solutions with sophisticated manners of implementation outside of the labour for income system. <coughs> To so we can start reducing monetary circulation to start curing this cancer as soon as possible. Um, basically, you can start solving that very quickly if we wanted to. If we simply made the collective decision to do it, we can do it. Otherwise, we're going to continue to pretend that the board game's relevant as it cumulatively destroys everything predictably. Thank you, Scott. There. The question is, do you think child poverty is a problem in Palmerston North? And if so, what will you do about it? Scott, can you please start? Absolutely. So um, the fact that we have children living in our society that um, are going hungry and the fact that we can now vote that, it, that that's OK and I, that we have to respect the people that vote for that and then we sit there and suffer for another three years while the children still suffer um, is, shows glaringly, obviously, the flawed logic of this archaic social system that we continue to play, play along with. So basically... Child poverty, how do you solve that? Absolutely. So basically, again, no concept of human need built into the model at all. If Once we recognise that, we can solve that very easily, very, very simply. And um, I just, can I just make this really clear? Unfortunately, this is really unfortunate that people don't think about it at election time because of this narrow, what you could, what you could call a myopic focus on just changing the government or just the election. If you take a broad view and understand what this cancer system is and what it's actually doing to our life support... Which, we're, which is life support is all that really matters, really, not the game. Um, when you take the broad view, you understand that what anything, unfortunately, that this lovely gentleman is going to do in his party, because they need to do it instantly, you have to change the government, I get that. But anything that they do, and this is unspeakable, is this has to be undone by the other party eventually, and it all has to flip backwards again, as it historically has done for the past 80 years, because of the pyramid fraud requirements that we suffer under. Now, this is unspeakable, but this is now posing an existential threat to our species. And these people refuse to talk about it publicly, and that is why it needs to be addressed at the structural level, unless the colonial era originated money system funding structures are uninstalled, and the Labour Party went outside of this in the 1930s, if you research, they are refusing to do it again. They are only going to cause more child suffering in the long term, and I, that's provable. Thank you. And uh, working with government agencies about what it is that they require. We have to be um, in those communities and have that knowledge to be able to, to do uh, the work that needs to be done. Uh, social investment is a big focus for the national government going forward and uh, we've invested heavily in the social investment policies and programme that we're looking to put in place, and that is through um, working with families in need. So, of what you've just said, what has changed over the last nine years that you've made different? Because what you've just said is that the entire mantra of the national government, social investment approach, and all the programmes, that you, whatever else is going on, and what you just mentioned, tell me why children living in poverty has increased under the national government? It hasn't increased under the national government. 
There's your answer. Know. How do you There's know? Your answer. You also, what, what, also a point you, you made. You refuse to even measure it. So also, how do you know whether it's it has, increased or it decreased? Been measured. Also the point What's you made no, it hasn't about been just What's the measure? No, it hasn't been measured. Also the point you made about just silk. I mean, Rebecca runs that program. It's a hand up, not a hand out. No, it needs to be expanded globally. Just that silk. idea. Yeah. Well, everything's she's upcycling food. In a resource-based economy, which is what the Money food, Free Party so proposes, everything's free and all work is voluntary because that's where we're heading. This charade can't continue much longer given the ecological and wealth extraction. Some $40 billion mm -hmm. a year extracted from our system to pay this interest, and that can only get worse as the pyramid fraud that which these people refuse to even acknowledge publicly, even though they know, um, and that it's an existential threat. It's a self-terminating right. system. Thank good, you. Good you have taught us a lot. Uh, yeah. Scott. It's your job to solve these problems. Good discussion. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, we, move on. we need to build more affordable houses. There's no doubt about that. And I, as I mentioned previously, we've got mechanisms and policies to be able to do that. But we've also got to curb that demand as well. Thank you. Uh, Adrian, if you'd like to... Uh, yes, supply and demand. We need to, to keep working at that. Um, can you just um, give you a question again? Question? Sorry. Thank you. Scott. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, clearly housing is an issue locally and nationally. Um, absolutely. It's beyond a crisis, um, especially when you've taken all the other stuff. Unfortunately, the housing that is in place is going to, like even people with mortgages are assuming that the money is going to be there to pay that back, and that's another big crisis that's coming that people aren't talking about yet. So anyway, basically, in regards, I think, I just kind of make this really clear that truncating the idea of what I would call a truncated frame of reference, this affordability idea is a real truncated frame of reference when it comes to if you want to actually solve the problem. So look, if you want to take an actual broad systems view on this and actually solve the problem, and I'm sure people do want to solve it, but unfortunately the problem with this is people really, really out there don't know how to arrive at these solutions because we're not conditioned to think this way. So anyway, um, if you want to actually solve the problem, then what we need to do is actually look at the real the real problem here is that, again, going back to the board game, right, apparently because of this blue value system that we, you know, we've been enduring for nine years, look, the structural violence that we endure as a result of that is an assault and in form a civil human rights violation. It completely goes against Article 25, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and your system simply does not have the mechanics to facilitate our future. And it's that simple. When you put this together, you do not have a social system that's actually capable. That it does not have anything. See, what brings market economics into equilibrium? This supply and demand argument, they say supply and demand. What is it that brings it into equilibrium? That is the core foundation of market economics. And what is it? I'd love someone to do the research because... And we all know this, it's the invisible hand of the market. So all these conversations are running in circles for 80 years is about how to get this invisible hand god going and moving the money around. You know, It's actually completely unviable in relation to true public health. We've got a century of data and public health research that invalidates the viability of this model as legitimate. Thank you. Um, so basically, um, yeah, so I look at mental health in a much broader context, which, you know, so one moment I say that, people can just t turn off and ignore me. So, but this is relevant. So basically, public health, true public health, is about having a society that rewards and reinforces social stability and cohesiveness. Unfortunately, the premise, the archaic premise of what we endure at the moment, is based on the exact opposite of that strategic domination, competitive advantage, and self-maximisation. Now, we can dress it up all we like by pretending that the government, the role of government, which, by the way, if you want to take a quantum leap outside of the traditional assumptions for a moment, the only reason that the government institution exists is to compensate for the inefficiency inherent in the whole destructive market construct. Right? So and they're doing a terrible job at it. Right? So basically, mental health. Look, I, I want to put, make this really clear because I've stated this publicly and I'm going to go even further. I've been in Ward 21 twice. I've tried to kill myself. I've even messaged Ian and told him that I was disappointed he wasn't talking about these issues. And who turned up? A police officer. Now, that is not Ian's fault. That's because of this ridiculous system we have that conflates law and order with... that, that conflates public health with law and order. Law and order is a public health issue, and if you want to reduce crime, reduce deprivation, reduce poverty, you need to start putting these issues together, because every major social problem we have is actually a structural result of a system force that is not being properly understood or incorporated. And it's really important that if you want to actually have a healthy society, 
that you actually, that we all, all of us, start to actually think broader about these issues because the ruling value system at the moment is clinically insane. So when people tell me mental health, Everyone's trying to make people conform to a clinically insane model. The great reversal is taboo to know, it's taboo to speak, and the suicide rates are only going to increase. These 10 year olds calling the suicide helplines are only going to increase if we continue to pretend that this ridiculous board game is real. Thanks, Jim. And, you know, first of all, I just want to acknowledge your comments, Scott, uh, and I really appreciate them. And, I think it's it's really important in society that we can talk about mental health. And I've been really impressed with this election campaign and all of the candidates around the country fronting up and talking about mental health, our own experiences with it, and others that we uh, love and their experience. Thank you, and Adrian. It's such a huge, a huge subject, and it's so emotional. And thank you, Scott, honestly, for sharing and well, resigning. It's disgusting what your, what your party has done to the country for nine months. The structural violence, and it's violence by the way, it's violent, hold it you speak, it's violent. If you vote blue you're inflicting violence across the population. I think that's unfair Scott. We have a hundred years of research on that. I think that's unfair. Um, this mental health stigma is only going to get worse because, can I just explain that, again, in this system, 2 plus 2 equals 5, and freedom equals slavery, and war equals peace. When you understand that, when you understand the great reversal and all the reverse projections that these people are talking about, you know, they think you're the mentally ill one when actually the whole value system is clinically insane because only more growth of the cancer is seen as a solution. And that's the problem here, is that we stigmatise people in society that actually understand this and call them mentally ill, when actually, I'm not picking on individuals here, because Adrian has a wonderful intention, I understand. The value system of our society is clinically insane. And until, until we start to address that as a society, and I'm putting it out there, that this society can only generate pathology as a result of its reward reinforcement system, until you address the structural psychology inherent, nothing is going to change and we have a century of data on that. Please apply it if you are paid to solve the problems.